it's Pyram King, and I'm super excited to bring to you another detailed guide to the Legends of Barovia, an expanded campaign to Curse of Strahd. This is the big one. This is it. This is Ravenloft. This is the first of several guides to Ravenloft. This is the road to Ravenloft, We're covering the road up to Ravenloft, the exterior of the castle. Some really cool content here. Excited to bring it to you. First and foremost, this wouldn't happen without your support. Those members who are donating both their time and their money to make this project a reality. Look at all these amazing Foundry supporters here. Now, all of these guides are being being made available for free under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy. The first one, the uh, play, uh, the campaign guide and player guide, is available to download for free. There's a link down in the description below. For those of you that are donating to this project, you're getting the early release playtest version of the guide. It's your input, your suggestions, your ideas. I take all of that, put it into a final version of that guide, send it off to Jesse Winters, the editor at Dual Storyteller to bring you a final edited version of that guide and releasing it to the public for free. Those supporters, they get a uh, colored version of the guide, additional artwork, my voice acting sound foil, so much more. In addition, if you support me uh, and donate at the Foundry level, all that free content, including the free maps, I put it all together for you as a special gift, a special thank you gift. The walls, the lighting, all that stuff that's a available in Foundry for you to enjoy, including the links to D&D Beyond. Of course, you're going to need to own Curse of Strahd and D&D Beyond for all that link and content to work. But all of it is done. You don't even have to think about it. We already have, over this last year plus, over 40 guides and 40 modules and releasing these great new, beautiful edited guides. Go ahead and check it down below. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, there are links down below to become a supporter and a member and get access to that free content as well. Now, two important people that make this all happen, you know my partners in this epic journey. First and foremost, we have DM Andy making some gorgeous battle maps. We got a special battle map just for you. This is the Road to Ravenloft. The ones we're going to be looking at are the free WebP versions that Andy is so gracious to share with us and the entire community for free. However, if you want those 8K high-resolution ver uh, uh, versions, nice day, weather effects, grid, non-grid, all those different versions and more are available on his Patreon page. There's a link in the description down below. Check him out and support him on this epic journey as well. In addition, all this stuff doesn't happen in Foundry without Blair, his scene packer module. Blair recently helped me create what's known as the V9 Plus versions for Foundry. What's amazing is Blair created these versions so they work in version 8, version 9, and version 10 in Foundry. So whether you're running in version 8 or version 10 or 9, these modules work. Huge shout out to Blair. If you're interested in creating your own amazing adventures for Foundry and his support, he's a genius with these with these uh, programming for, for Foundry and these modules. Check him out on his Patreon page. There's a link below. Both DM Andy and Blair are on our great Discord server. We have hundreds of people on there sharing their stories, their ideas, their art, their content. Come and join us on there. Blair and Andy, uh, DM Andy and Blair are on there also answering all these questions. It's, this has been an amazing journey. We have over 800, I think we have close to 880 supporters at this point. Just, I'm just blown away. Huge thank you. I mean, this would, wouldn't happen without you. So I really, really appreciate it. So let's dive into this road to Ravenloft. The first location we have here is a battle map here of the Western Gate. Now, this is the road as you're leaving Tester Falls and you're heading um, uh, towards Velaki, you're at the Western Gates of Barovia. And here it is, the Western Gates. There's the road. If you travel through these gates, you had you head to the Western uh, you head to, to, to Velaki. Now, what's interesting is before you get to Gates, there is a small road, there's a fork in the road that leads off into the mountains. And that fork is the road that leads you up into Ravenloft. And we got a little bit of description here. Looming not far ahead is the western gates of Barovia. The gates stand open. The features of this massive arch gate are more prominent and intact than the eastern gate 
which you passed through when you first entered Barovia. The wide cobblestone road has been well trodden over the centuries and continues northwest. A smaller road veers northeast off the main road. The road ascends and disappears under the fog of the forest mountains. Now let's take a look at the gorgeous battle map that DM Andy put together here for this. And we'll take a look at a couple things. So we can see here's the road here and it travels here. Here's the gates and that goes off to Vlaki this way. And there's a small road here and you're gonna see here in the small road, well, there is a covered wagon. Now, if the, if the players have been invited by straw to dinner or he's expecting them, a black carriage will await them on the small road and you're gonna tell them a large black carriage drawn by a team of four horses waits on the small road facing northeast. The horses stir, a steam rise blasts from their nostrils, a cloaked figure sits facing forward, holding the reins, their features hidden by the heavy dark cloak and hood as you approach the door to the carriage swings open silently. Now the figure on the holding the reins is a ghost. So the player's trying to interact with them, the ghost will just ignore the players. If the players attack the ghost, it will disappear and just the, the robes, the cloak will just fall to the seat where it's sitting. Once it feels it's undisturbed, the, the ghost will reform within the cloak and take its position again to lead the team of horses and the wagon to Ravenloft. Um, um, so the carriage will be there waiting for them. Now there's room inside for, for eight people. They get in the carriage, the carriage will take them right up uh, to Ravenloft. Now, this is the same carriage that the players, if they're using Count Lugosi's banner, that's the alternative to Death House, and at the end of that, you remember Rodden picks them up and takes them into the village of Barovia. This will be the same carriage. The car you should note the characters will recognize this. If the players were burying the Burgermeister in the church of Barovia and the carriage arrives with Strahd and Rodden, this is the same carriage. So they're going to identify with this carriage right away because they've most likely seen it before. It's going to be this exact same carriage. Now, if Strahd has not invited the player Players, or if Strahd is not expecting the players, the carriage will not be here and just make it disappear. Instead, what will happen is any players heading up this road that are not invited will be assailed by some ghost wolves. And we got the ghost wolves right here. Let's talk about these ghost wolves. These ghost wolf, let me just highlight them and, and bring them into play. These ghost wolf are the dire wolf stat block, except they have the ability to become invisible. They have invisible passage. It can take an action to be invisible. Now, Strahd put these ghost wolf out here to keep unwanted guests from going up the road to Ravenloft. So I would run either, you know, anywhere from three to six of these. You could roll a dice and do it randomly, uh, a 1D4 plus two, or a 1d6 plus one, but you want to keep, you know, this is a combat encounter, a low level of combat encounter, so this shouldn't be too deadly, obviously, depending on the levels of the party, but I would increase the count of the ghost wolves based on the number of players that you have, because you want to manage action economy here, not necessarily hit points. So if you've got, you know, five, six, or seven players, I would have at least five ghost wolves here. If you're at four or three, maybe anywhere from three to four ghost wolves here. Now these are only going to come out if the players are not invited or not inspected. Um, by by the uh, Strahd. So it's kind of a binary event. Either the coach is going to be waiting here for them or the ghost wolves are going to be lurking here in the, in the uh, shadows here waiting to attack the players who try to head up to Ravenloft. Now, as we approach Ravenloft, I spent a considerable amount of time uh, thinking about this. And one of the things that I thought about, about Ravenloft, it is an amazing location. And I remember when I first played uh, Ravenloft back in 1984, and I later went out and bought the module, I spent hours looking at that isometric map, just imagining what it is. It is a, a special location and all of, of uh, Dungeons and Dragons lore. It is so unique and so special I also believe, you know, it, it sits on this pillar. It also is the manifestation 
of Strahd's psyche in the things that he has gone through. So you're traveling up this road to this mountain, to this very special, unique location. It's not just a cool castle with Strahd in it with some traps and monsters. There's a unique, somber, macabre, foreboding atmosphere here that is kind of this, you know, I imagine kind of the mist kind of almost emanate from the castle. So I thought that heading up this road to Ravenloft shouldn't be a combat encounter, but it should be an encounter to do two things. There's two goals while we head up this road. The first goal is for the players to spend a moment as they're ascending through the mist up this mountain to this special location, this foreboding dark location that, that sits looming over all of Barovia, is to be introspective. Now, when we play and we create our characters in Dungeons & Dragons, we create our ideal, our bond, our flaw. And this is a time where the characters are going to revisit those and be introspective with themselves. Are they living up to their ideal? What is their bond? What is their flaw? And at the same time, during this ascension, as they're heading up this road, it's also a transcension where they're going to be learning about Strahd's psyche. What is Strahd's ideal? What is Strahd's bond? What is Strahd's flaw? How did Strahd go from a mortal man to this position? And how are we going to learn this? What is this unique, short ride experience going to be like? I really wanted the players to be in the frame of mind that they are leaving the, the lands of Barovia and heading up to this castle in the mist that is super foreboding and putting them in the mind and the psyche of what's going on here. And we're going to be doing that with a special encounter here. So after they travel up in this, whether they're walking up, they've defeated the wolves or they're heading up in this carriage, after the winding road through the forest laden with the mist, the road rises above the tree line and for the first views of Ravenloft shadow over you. And let's take a look at that. The road follows a steep cliff that drops off hundreds of feet below and it's hard to judge how far up above the mist. And I have a theater of the mind map for that. So. As you're traveling up the road, you see as you come, I imagine you're coming around the corner of the carriage. We got some carriage soundtrack. Let's put the carriage soundtrack on here. Give us some atmosphere here. So you're traveling up in the, the carriage sound. There it is. Let's see. I think you can hear it there. As you're traveling up and as you come around the bend, there it is. There's Ravenloft in the mist looming above you. And so this is, you, you play our characters are realizing at this point, this is it. This is, this is the location. Now, what happens here is DM Andy's made this gorgeous, unique battle map for this road to Ravenloft. And let's talk about what happens on this road. It's not going to be a counter, combat encounter. It's going to be what I would call a metaphysical encounter. Let's talk about how this works. So as the players are here in the carriage, they're traveling up this road, they've seen Ravenloft looming in the mist as they're going along the edge of this cliff. And by this way, this cliff drops off you know, a thousand feet. They go over the cliff and they're dead. There's no rolling dice at this point. That's a thousand feet down. As they get up to the first uh, switchback, they're gonna see a statue here. And what what's gonna happen is this. The player is going to, one player, you're gonna choose a player. Now you can randomly choose a player. You can roll a dice and choose a player. Or you can look at each player, look at, you know, their ideal, their bond of flaw, and select one in which you think it might be interesting for them to go through this experience. And there's gonna be four statues. We're gonna go through each one of them. So one of the players, imagine the carriage, all of a sudden the player's looking out, it sees Ravenloft. They're starting to be a little introspective, right? The mist envelops them. Time seems to have slowed down. The player is alone. The statue they see out their window appears to be animated, but the characteristics remain elusive. You become aware that there's a sentient being stands before you within the statue. There is no sound. But in your mind, a question begins to form. So I've got a theater of the mind map. Let's do the first one here. Let's bring that up. So as you're going around, you see this statue, and this, this thing begins to form in the statue. And you're going to select one player. You can drag and drop him. I've got my character here, which is me. I'll just drag and drop him. Here I am. 
drag them and drop them into the scene. We got theater of the mind scene. And what happens is the statue in their mind asks them this question. What is your truth? What is your truth? What is your ideal? Now, the players will hear this. They'll also see it pop up in the chat. And what happens is the player can choose to tell the statue or the spirit that's asking this question the absolute truth. What is their ideal? Or the player can decide to obscure the truth or lie. The player can answer completely any way they wish. But it's important for the player to indicate to the DM if they are letting the spirit know the absolute truth or they're trying to hide it or obscure it or actually flat out lie. Regardless upon how they answer, the player must succeed a Wisdom DC 10 saving throw. Now, if the player is being absolutely truthful, they will automatically succeed. On a success, the spirit is convinced the player is being truthful and will share a truth, in this case, Strahd's ideal. Okay. In addition, that particular player will get a plus one to all their wisdom saves and intelligent saving throws for 24 hours if they succeed that saving throw, which they automatically do if they tell them the absolute truth. And this is what the spirit will share about Strahd's ideal. Listen carefully. I have witnessed the Lord of Barovia travel this road for centuries. Aspiration has no bearing on the moral compass. For fear is the mother of morality and compassion its father. As a man, he justified peace through vengeance and believed he was on a righteous path for the greater good. Alas, he was unaware such a path would lead to a life of damnation. So the players learn that Strahd's ideal was aspiration. And aspiration doesn't have a moral compass. And if the players at this juncture, they may or may not have read some of the lore books that they found, but they realize the spirit is telling him that, uh, that you know, he's been watching Strahd for centuries. What's important here is that these spirits that are manifesting in these statues, these spirits of Ravenloft, they're neither good or bad. They are simply see what is. Who these spirits are, if it's one spirit or multiple spirits, perhaps a scholar from another century, they've been here for centuries. They have seen Strahd over the centuries go from this transformation from a mortal being to an immortal being and everything that's happened in between. Right, they've been here for four centuries. The entire life of Strahd they have seen. And so they're looking at Strahd from a, a psycho metaphysical, you know, thinking about him spiritually of what has happened with him and sharing with you, if you answer correctly, his bonds, his flaws, and his ideals. So you're learning something about Strahd as you're approaching the castle, if you happen to be truthful. Now if you happen to lie to this spirit right? You're not going to get the benefit if you failed that wisdom saving throw. And the spirit is going to say this to you. A harmful truth is better than a useful lie. Now, as you approach, that was the first one. As you continue to approach, you're going to go up to another switchback as you're heading up. Now, these spirits can also uh, ask you these questions if you're walking up, but this is, you know, whether you're in the coach or walking up, they're going to stop at each one of these these um, statues, and you're going to select another player, and another player is going to go through that, that same experience that you just did. You know, the player is going to, uh, a mist develops the player, they're going to be looking out the carriage wagon, time has seemed to slow, the statue appears to be animated, but it's just elusive. You can't really figure out what it is, but you know that there's just some kind of sentient being there, and a question forms in your mind. And this time, that question is, what is your bond? What is your allegiance? Again, the player can't answer any way they wish to. They need to inform the dungeon master, are they being 
accurate and truthful, or are they trying to obscure the truth or lie? So they say anything they want to. Again, this is a a question that they're not speaking out loudly, that the, but they've heard this question in their mind, and they're asking this, this, they're answering this. You could say almost rhetorically making an introspective look into themselves about their own bond, I think living truthfully and up to their own bond. If they answer correctly their bond, they're going to have to make that wisdom saving throw. If they succeed that wisdom saving throw or they answered accurately, they're going to get plus one to their constitution and charisma saving throws for the next 24 hours. And the statue is going to share Strahd's bond with the player. And here it goes. One life is all most of us have, and we live it as we believe in living it. But to sacrifice what you are and to live without belief that is a fate more terrible than dying the lord of barovia has a why to live and can endure almost anyhow as an immortal seeking a forgiveness beyond the pale alas he has never realized that forgiveness is a virtue of the brave and the final form of love which will forever elude him. So Strahd's bond in this case is forgiveness. He has murdered his brother in order to become an immortal vampire and he's come up with some kind of crazy macabre justification for the greater good and Tatiana, the woman that he's loved, she's committed suicide and he is seeking forgiveness in the wrong places. He's He has been passionately pursuing Tatiana, not where he should be asking for forgiveness which was murdering his brother right? and so this forgiveness bond that he has will be ever forever elusive to him. He will never get it because being able to forgive, that's a brave act, and it is the final act of love, and who he should be asking for forgiveness is his brother, not searching out Tat for Tatiana, hoping that she falls in love with him. So, again, you're getting some insight into Strahd's psyche from the spirits that have been imbued into these statues of spirits of Ravenloft that have been watching Strahd for centuries. As you further travel up, we come to another switchback here as we're traveling up this road to Ravenloft, ascending higher and transcending, if you will. And there's another statue. And in this one, you're going to pick another player. You're going to bring him in to this theater of the mind map or however you want to do this. And the statue in this case is going to be asking what their flaw is. What is your weakness? And again, the player can answer any way they wish, but they need to inform the DM or the DM needs to determine, are they being forthright and honest about it? Are they trying to obscure the truth of their flaw or lie, outright lie? Now, if they answer truthfully and or they succeed the wisdom saving throw DC 10, they will get be granted a plus one to their strength and plus one to their dexterity saving throws for the next 24 hours. And the spirit will share with them Strahd's flaw. So let's go hear what that is. Hatred is blind as well as love, but lust is far stealthier. Lust enters the mind as a guest, becomes a host, and then the master. It is the master of desire, often unattainable. From the deepest desires often come the deadliest hate. An immortal haunted by such a yearning is a lethal adversary, often underestimated. So here we know that Strata is obviously he is pursuing Tatiana. His flaw is his lust, his desire for Tatiana that has, has led him down a path of hatefulness. And he's and the statue and the spirit is also warning you that an immortal who's, who has such a yearning can be 
you know, very lethal adversary, often men underestimated because he's driven. You know, this is not about being smart or greedy or powerful. He's driven by this this unattainable desire to obtain Tatiana. And, and if something gets in his way, well, you can be assured that Strahd will, will pull out no stops to deal with that. All right, as the, the carriage continues up to its final switchback here, let's turn the carriage around. There we go. And it's heading up its final switchback. We have one last statue here before we get to the gates of Ravenloft. You know, and this whole point of this trip is for the players to take some time to think about themselves, but also learn a little bit about Strahd before they enter into this very dark domain. So the last statue is right here before we get to the gates. Here it is. There's a little lantern here casting out. And in this particular case, um, this statue, all the players... All the characters that are in the wagon are going to be enveloped by the mist. Uh, time is going to seem to slow down, almost stop. And they're going to see the statue out the window next to the carriage animate in this kind of unreal, unworldly way. And they're going to realize that there's a senti sentient being. And in their mind, a question is going to form. And this is what all of the players will hear. Are you collectively brave enough to cross the threshold. Now at this point, every single player is given the opportunity and every player needs to speak about their bravery. Are they brave enough to cross the threshold to head into Ravenloft? You've spent this trip moving up through the mist, physically going higher, reaching this high plane, this castle in the mist, this place of unspeakable evil and you're learning about the psyche of the master who lives there, Lord Strahd, are you brave enough to go through there? And this is a great role-playing moment for those players to really, really think about their character and to speak in terms of their character being brave. Now, no matter how the players answer, the statue will respond. Right? It's not going to respond with one of these, you lied to it. It's going to respond to all the players. Now, if the players had uh, succeeded in their saving throw or answered honestly to the, all three previous statues, so they succeeded all three previous statues, if they did, this statue here, the spirit, is going to buff the entire party. Every party member is going to get plus one to their attack rolls for the next 24 hours. If one of the players lied or failed their lied and failed their, their wisdom saving throws on one of their statues, they're not going to get this buff. However, when the players are done sharing whatever they, they believe, why they are brave enough to cross the threshold, this is what the statue will tell them. No one is so brave that they are not disturbed by something unexpected. That which does not kill you makes you stronger. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Some of us think holding on makes us strong, but sometimes it is letting go. Realize these truths, and you will find strength. So this journey, players have learned a little bit about the psyche of Strahd, his ideal, his bond, his flaw. Players have spent some time being introspective, and you are now at the gates ready to enter in Barovia. Whether you've ascended on your own free will or you've gotten in this carriage, you've gone through this experience. And it's kind of a psyche, you know, preparing you for the world that you're about to enter. When you approach uh, Castle Ravenloft, there are two guard posts with a drawbridge, which is lowered. And across the chasm, uh, Ravenloft sits on this huge pillar overlooking uh, Barovia. You're going to see these guard houses, and we've got a, a, the gatehouses here, and I'll bring that up for you to take a look at. Bring down the carriage right here. Now, as you approach the gatehouse, and we've got some Ravenloft theme music here. I'll turn it up for you. There's these two gatehouses that stand in the mist. The drawbridge is lowered, and an eerie light 
reflects through the entrance to the keep uh, in there. Now, the draw, the drawbridge is lowered. There's a still calmness about it. You see these two guardhouses there. In these guardhouses, there are two undead guards. These undead guards, and I'll open them up, are phantom warrior stab blocks. I just called them undead guards. And the undead guards will remain hidden in the two towers on the left and right if uh, the players arrive or leave by the carriage. If the players are not invited and they're coming on their own, these guards will come out and attack. Now, you can use the uh, Theater of the Mind map here to run your encounter, or we can go back to the road to Castle Ravenloft, and you will see here at the final entrance those guardhouses right here before we cross the drawbridge, and we've got the two guards right in there. So those guards will come out only if the players are uninvited, they're not in the carriage. Now, if Strahd is defeated, these guards will simply disappear. Now we're about to head in to Ravenloft, and I'm really excited as we head across the drawbridge for the first time and enter in to the, the walls and into the keep, into the ward, the courtyard, the ward of Castle Ravenloft. And this is the player's first sight of Ravenloft that they see. I've got a theory of the mind map here, and let's take a look. So the players come through the, the, um, the two uh, dome towers through the, over the drawbridge. They come into the courtyard, the ward. And what they see here is, and let's get this off, we got the... Uh, front courtyard. The clouds above are bleak and dark. A storm is brewing as a drizzle of rain begins. The castle looms in the shadows of a cold fog swirling about the ward within the curtain walls. The main doors of the castle are illuminated by two large torches. The flagstone courtyard and stone walls are wet from the constant drizzle of rain and mist. The courtyard is enclosed by the looming 90 feet high curtain walls. High above the parapet protects the barren uh, wall walk. There seems to be no guards present. Your attention is drawn by the sound of a rattling chain as a thick wooden iron portcullis comes slamming down behind you. You notice the massive drum towers, each with a large wooden door flank, the gate, and the drawbridge. Here we are. So there's the, the main entrance to Ravenloft, the two torches, Fog is heavy, storm is brewing, it's dark, it's foreboding. You've gone up this road and you are now in Strahd's domain. Now let's talk a little bit about this location and I'm gonna bring up Diamandi's gorgeous battle map of the, the walls, the exterior of Ravenloft. We're gonna take a look at that from the battle map perspective right now. So the players arrive here. Here's the carriage right here. I'll bring the carriage, there we are. And as the players come through here, here's the, the, the um, drawbridge, as they come through here, the, the gate comes slamming down. The players notice that they're now stuck in, Ra they're stuck in Ravenloft unless they can figure out another way out. Now, if the carriage arrives, uh, PCs arrive by carriage, the carriage will stop in the courtyard, let them out, and the carriage will disappear and head off to the carriage house, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, if the players are allowed to leave uh, Castle Ravenloft with Strahd's permission, the carriage will return here, pick up the players, like after dinner or whatever, maybe they were there visiting with Strahd, and they will take them down the way it came and drop them off at the western gates where we started uh, in this particular guide. Now. Uh, if the players uh, are invited and they approach the main door that we saw in the Theater of the Mind map, the main door, if they approach, will just open up, welcoming them inside. If the players have come here as uninvited guests here, the door is closed. Uh, it takes a strength, and it's barred from the inside, it takes a strength uh, check DC 24 to open. Now, if the players are using a crowbar or something to pry open that door, it lowers that DC check down to 20. Now, the two drum towers, that's these towers right here, we can see inside house the, uh, 
the um, mechanism to raise and lower the drawbridge and the gate, which is which has just come down, crashing down. These are magically controlled by Strahd, and the only way to open up that gate or raise and lower the drawbridge is one of two ways. You defeat Strahd, or you can use Dispel Magic DC-14, and then you can mechanically open and close the gate and open and close the drawbridge. One player has to be in each one of these, one player to the north, one player to the south, to, to mechanically open up the gate. It takes two players to do that one in each location. And depending on what's going on at the time, that can be that can probably get a little hairy in order for you guys to do that, for your players to do that. It leaves a little bit of uh, some mechanical uh, room for some exciting encounters in the future, just setting that up. Now, something is important about the drawbridge. Strahd never raises the drawbridge unless the castle is under siege. So the drawbridge remains down. The only thing he shuts when players enter is the uh, portcullis um, gate that will come down. It's controlled by these two room mechanisms uh, up here. All right, let me, uh, let me ex exit this carriage. Here I am. I just get out. There I am. I'm all happy. I'm exiting here. It's like fun. I'm a little spooked out. And we're going to travel around the outside of Castle Ravenloft. So there's the front. And we notice that the reward and the gate goes here to the, to the north. And we travel through here. And we notice that there's an opening in this gate right here. This is the north center court gate. Uh, the massive curtain wall connects to the keep here. And a 20 foot wide, 20 foot tall archway passages through the connecting wall. Uh, as you enter, as you get close to this gate, you'll see this gate is down. As you, you get close to it, it automatically opens up, allows you to pass. The reason it does this magically is this permits the carriage right, to go to and fro. Here's the carriage here. I'll just show it again. There it is. Uh, it allows the carriage to go to and fro the carriage house, which is right here. Let's just bring the carriage over here. So the carriage is able to go through and go into the carriage house. So let's stick it in the carriage house, and it's going to sleep now. So you, when you come through this, this gate, this curtain wall over here, you're now in the servant's courtyard here. The northwest ward of the keep is enclosed by towering walls of stone. Carriage house with hinge wood doors stands silently in the corner where the outer wall meets. Along the keep is a slender wooden door reinforced with iron bands leads into the keep. An archway in the wall to the south leads to another small courtyard. So you'll notice here there's another small courtyard here. Now I'm going to just reset the fog of war so you guys can see this from a player's perspective because you can see everything here. But let's just see what the player is going to see. The player is not going to see, can't see anywhere you know, because of the fog war, but they can say, oh, there's another entrance through the here. There's a door over here. This door leads into the servant's entrance area K23, which we'll be covering in the next video. The door has been frozen shut. It's been swollen. It's old wooden door. It takes a strength check DC 10 for you to break open this door and enter the castle uh, this way. Now, if the players uh, head north here, you'll see that the carriage house, there's two doors that open up. They're not locked, easy to open. And they go into the carriage house, they will see the large black carriage sits in there quietly. The horses and driver are missing. Now, if they inspect the carriage, they'll see the cloak of the driver sitting on the seat where he was riding. Um, but the horses and the driver are gone. The horses and driver are spirits, and they only materialize when the black coach is needed. They'll go to the front, pick anybody up at the front uh, courtyard of the castle, and take them down to the western keep, or if Rodadin needs it, which the players may have seen Rodadin about Morovia in this coach, that's when the coach comes out. So let's head down to the courtyard now. If they head through the wall here, Oh, look, there's an entrance right over down here. This is a gorgeous palomite, by the way, DM Andy put together. We're here in the chapel garden. Let me just close this. The 
small garden is impressed by the massive curtain walls. The two trees are dead and the flower beds are full of weeds and plants which endure this bleak environment. To the west are the large stained glass windows over here. Some are broken which decorate the castle's chapel. This is the chapel over here. The statue of a king stands prominently in the center of the small chapel garden. It is weathered over the centuries. The face is worn away. A pair of iron gates stands to the east right over here and to the south and north are a small archway leading out of the small garden. So if the players inspect this statue, there's a there's a name that's barely, barely legible below the statue and reads King Barov von Zarovich, King of Kadia and Lord of Barovia. Now if you remember from the history or the timeline, um, and the players will learn this over time, that uh, King Zarovich uh, von Zarovich arrived with his son, Prince Strahd, to fight the Turk forces when the war, the Great War, was going on. And king, uh, the king was murdered, along with his wife and his daughter. Uh, and Strahd took over his family's army, his father's army, sought vengeance. And this was a big turning point in Strahd's life. Well, he was a mortal prince, and, and he had this statue built to his, to his father, who he's had these aspirations to live up uh, in his father's mind. So this is the statue of his father here. Now the iron gates over here are unlocked and if they travel through the iron gates, they enter in to the overlook area. Now beyond the iron gates is a small flagstone path that leads to an overlook. Flanking the path are a set, uh, two sets of wooden doors the first set, on those closies here, look at it from the player's perspective. Uh, the first set leads to some small stone outbuildings. The second set leads to what appear to be two small bastions that flank the overlook. The dark clouds gather overhead and a light cold rain begins to fall. Three steps down lead to the overlook. Now before we get to the overlook, let's talk about these rooms up here. We'll go to the north room first. And if you enter into the north room, all these doors are unlocked, by the way. The north, north stone outbuilding, the room is small, is covered in dust and cobwebs and broken furniture. It appears to be servants' quarters. Now, if the players search this room, they're going to find some gardening tools here and realize their room once belonged to the gardener, the one that probably took care of the beautiful garden, the once beautiful garden, chapel garden there. Now, what's interesting is the players will find something interesting here. They'll find this silver spade. And this isn't any normal silver spade. This is a magic silver spade. The par players, if they do perform an arcana check, DC 12, they'll realize there's something magical about the spade. And it's not until they use a spade that they realize what is magical. If you use a spade planting any plant, a baby plant, a dead plant, a plant that's dying, once you use the spade and it touches into the dirt with the plant, the plant will grow and blossom within an hour. So a dead plant will uh, miraculously, within an hour, go into full bloom and strength, or baby seed will grow into the full plant. It's a really cool, fun little magic item that the gardener probably used to keep that garden beautiful at one time. I wanted to throw that in there um, just as something as a unique magic item, kind of um, takes the, the oppressive, uh, morbid uh, place that you're in and, and brings a little bit of life there, right? You know, imagine, you know, like they go to the garden, you use this this shovel, that, that beautiful flower will come back and blossom again. So I wanted to bring something that, that brought a positive light to the element. So some little unique magic item there. Now, if the players head south to the stone building to the south and they enter into the stone building to the south, the room is covered in dust and cobwebs, very similar to the one in the north, but the room appears to house various tools by carpenters and stone masons. If they begin to search the tools, they will awaken a phase spider. Now the phase spider, whoever does the search, the phase spider will gain surprise against the player. Now the phase spider, is this is a normal phase spider from Rose's Ring. The one thing I would do is with the ethereal John, it doesn't move from the material plane to the ethereal plane. I would just have it move into a, a different kind of temporal plane of existence, almost invisible as a bonus action, and then it comes back out, vice versa, it comes back out. So it's kind of making these jumps, you know, it's kind of a creepy spider, it has a normal spider bite, 
the spider will gain again surprise of the player that's searching the room and they'll, so that's hiding over there in the cobwebs now if the players do find they'll find some mason's tools carpenter tools wood carver tools and some iron this was clearly the room in the warehouse for the people working and taking care of the castle anything upkeep on the castle was probably done out of this room here now the players when they come out and they move towards the overlook they'll t see two round bastions these are small uh circular battlements um, that flank the overlook and the one to the north that they step into the one to the north uh, this bastion is covered in dust and cobwebs there are no windows there's a single murder hole which opens down the cliff face uh, there's a broken bar barrel with various pieces of wood and that are scattered about the floor. Now, a murder hole is a hole usually somewhere above in the castle that faces down, and that's for people in the castle to drop rocks or hot oil or whatever on anybody trying to climb up. So I imagine these two bastions are right on the edge of the cliff near the overlook, and if anybody's trying to climb up the edge, they have this hole where they can drop things down to try to knock people off the edge of the cliff. Now in this particular one in the north, if the players search it, they're going to find 1d6 oil flasks. And those oil flasks, as you know, can be used to catch fire. So this is a perfect item that you would find there that next to a murder hole. These oil flasks, they'd probably light them on fire and drop them down the side of the cliff. Everybody climbing up would be caught on fire and covered in this oil and, and burned to death. If they head to the south bastion uh, armament, they will find, uh, again, there it's very similar to the one to the north. Uh, again, there's a murder hole there, opens down the cliff. But there's an old crate, sits in the corner, some broken barrels. Here, the players will find 3D6 crossbow bolts and a bag of ball bearings. Now, what I wanted to do in these four locations is include some stuff that doesn't seem just like weapons or magic weapons, but are some items that players can figure out how to creatively use as maybe they're exploring the Ravenloft. Maybe those ball bearings will be useful. Maybe those flask of oils will be useful. Maybe one of those tools they're, they're gonna need later on uh, you know, uh, will be useful. For instance, you know, there's uh, there's quite a few tools, mason's tools, carpenter tools. So something in there might be useful as they're scouting throughout the castle. Of course, they don't need to take them with them if they won't want to. Now, at the end, we get to the overlook. And I got a, v uh, a view of the overlook, so let's take a look at when you get to the edge of the overlook. What do you see? You got a special view there. You're looking down from the overlook and you see the village of Brovi. You can see there's the church down there. It's lighted up. There's the village kind of lit up. There's the fog. In the distance, you see the village of Barovia. And out of the mist, you hear a faint voice. You don't know if you're actually hearing it or if it's in your mind, but you hear a voice. And this is what you hear. With love's light way. Did I perch these walls? For its stony limits cannot hold love out. Under love's heavy burden, do I fall into the mist below? Parting is such sweet sorrow. I love you, Sergei, with all of my heart. The voice you're hearing is an echo from the past. It's Tatiana. You are standing at the overlook where Strahd's obsession, Tatiana, Sergei's lover, fiance, took her own life after Sergei died. And this echoing voice that you're hearing coming up from the mists from the valley where she threw herself off and, and fell a thousand feet below off the cliff and, and died, committed suicide. This is a reminder uh, to the players, and it's, you, you, the players can figure out who it is. I love you, Sergei, with all my heart. It's obviously the voice of Tatiana coming from the past to the present, a haunting uh, voice there, reminding that the, where the players are standing. You are standing at the, you know, you could say the catalyst location 
that created this entire horrific world. This is the moment where Tatiana leapt off the cliff, and that's what she's saying. She says, under love's heavy burden, do I fall into the mist below? Um, and it's pretty heavy. It's a pretty weighted, weighty moment as the players are looking off and seeing the village of Barovia down below. Now, there's one thing interesting here about the walls of Lake Ravenloft and standing here on the edge of this, there's two things that are important to point out. Now, if a character decides to look over the edge, they have a passive wisdom perception check of 15 or higher, they're going to notice underneath the stone overlook on which they stand about 100 feet down, there's a stone construction with three windows that protrude from the cliff. This is actually the king's burial room, and it's a, it's a way to get in, another way to get into the catacombs below the castle. Now, a player can try to go over the edge and descend. It's pretty difficult. It's about 100 feet down. It's underneath an overhang. They're going to need climber's kit or some kind of magic to do it. Um, it'd be some heavy dexterity rolls to try to do this to get down there and get through the window to get into a catacomb this way. But it is a possibility. They might not see this. They might not be looking over the edge. But there's something else that's interesting that happens here. You'll notice on the map, on the corner of this overlook, there's two gargoyles. And these aren't any ordinary gargoyles. If any character tries to go over this edge, or looks like they're gonna go over the edge, the gar it triggers the gargoyles to come to life. Now these are stone construct gargoyles. And what the gargoyles are gonna do is they're going to grapple the player and drag the player back up the flagstone path and let them go. They're not gonna try to attack the player. That is not what the gargoyles are doing. They're just gonna grab anyone that tries to go over the edge and drag them back. The players could decide to fight them. They're a uh, stone construct gargoyle. They don't have any attack. All they do is grapple. You might be asking yourself, why would these gargoyles do this? Well, this is where Tatiana committed suicide. Strahd created these gargoyles after she committed suicide to, com to, to stop uh, anybody else from leaping off the edge. Remember Tatiana's soul is being reborn in other young women that Strahd's pursuing. And if he brings another woman to the castle and hope and, and winning her unreciprocated love and, and, and finding, you know, winning his lost love, he doesn't want her, you know, with Tatiana's soul to re Tatiana's soul to redo what Tatiana did is run to the overlook and jump. So these gargoyles are there not to help the players. The gargoyles are there in case Strahd brings back another woman with Tatiana's soul that Tatiana's soul doesn't do the same thing and you know take a header off off the off the overlook. So the gargoyles will protect any creature that tries to go over the edge by grappling them and dragging them back and that was just a creation of Strahd which ironically may help the players or hinder the players if they're trying to get over the edge to get into the crypt underneath by this way. Well that's it for the exterior of Ravenloft and the road leading up to Ravenloft. We got three beautiful battle maps, some theater of the mind maps here. I really hope that you enjoyed uh, the road to Ravenloft. This will be uh, included in the full um, Foundry module and full PDF guide that I'm working over this next month to complete. The next video will be covering the first floor. DM Andy is making these beautiful battle maps for Ravenloft. We'll be covering each one with all the new content to Legends of Barovia. Make sure to make sure to click like and subscribe to the channel so you can be updated. If you are interested in donating and supporting me in this epic journey, you can by clicking on those links below. Until next time, may all your roles be critically successful.